to. <laughs> and we'll keep we're gonna get straight into some stuff. You know, as far as you know, some of the bigger groups will still tell the story, but you guys kinda of already know that story. Taylor might not, but you might have looked at some stuff already. I read a little bit on the profile. On, on the, the Centre for Health one? On the which one, sorry? Centre for Health. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And Oh, that's good. Very nice, pointed leaflet. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. So, thanks for coming along tonight. And as I said, there's a few others that have paid to come along, but they couldn't make it because they have some playing on, unfortunately. Um, but we've, um, yeah, we'll catch them up at some other point. But we're grateful to have you both here. So thanks for taking the time out to come. We're gonna the session that we've talked about. Um, that we'll post up about is to do with the link between our physical and emotional health. And so we'll, we'll cover off um, how I see those linking together. And as we go through that, it would be good just to um, get some input from you guys as well and get your questions so that we can just tailor it even more specifically to you guys. Um, which we normally wouldn't get to do in a larger group, but because of what you guys here in a smaller group, we can <coughs> be more specific about some of it. So should you wish to um, go on to share some of those things. Um, if you feel comfortable to do so, that's great. It just gives us the opportunity to be quite specific and we can, you don't have to be uh, too specific about the situations. It just gives us the opportunity to look into more of the actual um, specifics. Instead of talking around in generalities, we can be more specific and that's usually more helpful for people. So I'll leave that for you guys if you want to bring up some stuff or um, any other questions as we go through, just feel free to ask them and, and say, well, what about this situation? What about this? Um, I'm happy to do the best I can to answer whatever you guys have. So before we get started, also, um, um, I guess stuff and safety, actually. Should we need to, in an event of emergency, we'll go back out the way we came, down the stairs and out the back. <laughs> um, there's bathrooms uh, across the other side of the hallway, like through this, go down this way a little bit and walk through that room. And then you'll see the bathroom is just on the other side of this building. Um, what else do we need? Is that cool? Uh, so the other only thing that I'd like to do before we get started is to just get an idea from you guys about what, you know, you saw the thing, you know, the poster or whatever, or you've had someone, you know, suggest that you come along. What were some of the things that you would like to get out of tonight? Or what, when you saw the topic, what did you... What inspired you to come, or what got you to come along? What are some of the things that are relevant to you that we can put out? Maybe some of the questions even that you have in mind that we can just put up here, just so I've got it to, in my mind, cover it as we go through. Was there anything that came to mind, anything that we'd like to have a greater understanding or better idea about? Um, I think that the one that detach myself from things that I cannot change about other people, like my 18-year-old son. Right. <laughs> you can't change in others. Yeah. Cool. What else? Oh, just breaking some old habits. Yep. So talk about breaking old habits. Yeah. Also, finding what triggers create some of the bad habits. Finding triggers. Or learning how to deal with them. Right. Great. So if you know identify what the triggers are, and then knowing what to, once you know what they are, it's still the next step is do something about it. We can find out what they are, but <laughs> sometimes doesn't mean we're going to do anything about it. That's cool. Yeah, that triggers me. I don't really want to do anything about that yet. Stress, how, to, how that affects us. Um, like you think you've got a cold or a sore knee, but actually. Oh, right, yeah. Mm. The physical link, so. Mm. Anything that came to your mind you mm. Overall, got something for me both like, mm. 
somebody else to put it onto. No, no. I just want to be able to. Over the top? Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. So let's uh, we'll cover we'll, yeah we'll cover most of those things if not all of them as we go through, um, and that'll help us both I guess understanding it. So I'll, it's a good for us to get straight into it because I want to really um, spend more time on once we've understood how these are linked together, spend more time on. Okay, what are we actually going to do about it? What can we, so for each of you tonight, I want you to have something that you can go and do about it. Right, so there's an action plan, and you feel there's something that you can go and do. Uh, in bigger groups, we don't really get the chance to do that. Spend more time doing the explaining and understanding thing, but for you guys tonight, it'd be good to come up with by the end of tonight, there's something that you know that you can go and do right, that's relating to this, that's going to change your perception a little bit, might be. So, <coughs> Uh, let's, let's start here. We usually have, um, we'll find ourselves um, in these unwanted circumstances, we could say. Mm -hmm. right. Some of those unwanted circumstances might be, <coughs> uh, I find myself in old habits that I'd like to not be doing. Um, find myself trying to change other people, <laughs> or have expectations of others, mm -hmm. right, or end up in circumstances that I don't want to be in. Um, might be stressed out, might end up with some even physical symptoms, so that could work here too, so let's put that up. So we might have unwanted circumstances or physical symptoms, even. Okay. Um, so some of the ones, what would be some physical symptoms that we get or that we um, end up having that are unwanted? Yeah, yeah, so it could be stuff like eczema, yeah. Back, back. back pain, mm -hmm. yeah. What are the other kind of symptoms? Eating badly. Yeah, which leads to? Weight gain, yeah. Yeah, so it might be weight gain. Yeah. Any other Headaches. Stuff? Headaches, mm -hmm. knee pain you mentioned before. Yeah. Lots of tears. Tears. What now would be some circumstances that we find ourselves in that we don't want to be in? So these are some physical symptoms, right? What now would be some circumstances that we find ourselves in? A confrontation. Yeah, cool. <laughs> confrontation, yeah. yeah. Workplace, at home, right, wherever. What else? What are the circumstances, situations do we find ourselves in that we actually don't want to be in? There's situations where you feel obligated, so like right. that you feel like you you have to do this, but you don't really want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> but you do it anyway. But you have to do it. You feel like you have to do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that those kinds of situations where we feel like we have to do something, and we believe, oh, if I could just choose not to do it, I'd do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Cool. What else? Um. Probably. <laughs> I suppose for some people, unhappy relationships. Right, so relationships can be part mm. of it, eh? Yeah. I suppose it's not really just, you know, like spouse ones, it's like family ones. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. yeah. yeah. And you can't choose them. Can't divorce them either. Yeah. Sometimes it's even work. Or flay them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm. Family ones could be work ones, even. Mm. Relationships at work. Certainly family ones. Mm. Cool. What other situations do we find ourselves in? We don't want to be in. For some, for some people, it's work. They don't actually like being at work. Mm. Or in their current work situation, they could still be somewhere else. Mm. What else could be an unwanted circumstance? bad health and things, you know, if you were unwell. Yeah. Yeah, some people even it's um in the being in a particular place. Right? Or live in a particular house or a space and they actually don't want to be there. They want to move from there or they want to move the city or they want to move country or they want to move, you know, fill in the blank. <laughs> Just want to move. Yeah, yeah. They just want to get yeah. out of here. <laughs> right. So 
That could be part of it too. Where the front end stars in I want to six such as prefer not to be here or we keep thinking about someone else that we'd rather be when we believe that would be better for us. Um, and so a lot of times while we do try and change these circumstances or physical symptoms, um, for some reason they keep following us. So let's use these ones for an example. What have we tried before for things like back pain? Well, actually, back in pharmacy days, for these symptoms, back pain, um, headache, knee pain, eczema, we'll be giving you yeah, four times what, a day. A medicine, right? Mm. To go, okay, here's X medicine for that. Now you, you'll be yeah. fine. Diet. Right, yeah. So for it, right, here's a new diet or exercise plan that you need to go on. Or here's the new fad in exercise, CrossFit or it's, I don't know, Pilates or yoga or whatever, right? Which everyone needs to do now because that's the new thing, right? So what else, what other kind of symptom controls or symptom management do we do? Sometimes it's... Stock the tissues and tears at the top. Tissues. <laughs> yes. Alcohol and wine. Right. <laughs> Uh, wine. We don't want to feel these things, right? And so do something about it, right? Sometimes we'll use medicine, sometimes we're trying all these different things here to avoid feeling these things. What about over here? What do we do about these kind of circumstances? I like to pretend they're not happening. Pretend that it's not there. <laughs> so Ignore it. <laughs> Ignore it. Yeah. Hope it goes away. Wait for it to go away. <laughs> yeah. If I wait long enough, it will stop. Yeah, yeah. I'll outlast it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait for it to go. Pretend we ignore. Um, what else would we use to help us feel better? Maybe even some of the alcohol, wine, tea. Some shopping. Maybe we'll use some shopping. <laughs> Maybe we'll use some food. instant gratification. Yeah. Maybe we still even use some medicines over here. Yeah. Some non pharmaceutical. So, non -pharmaceutical. Yep. so what, that's what we normally do with this kind of stuff, right? We try and solve the symptom, we try and fix the thing that's showing up on the surface, right? This is all the stuff on the surface, right? Something's going on, right? That thing's showing up in my life, I want to get rid of it. This stuff's showing up on the surface, these symptoms, I want to get rid of it by doing whatever it is here. Right? That's our usual kind of mode of action. What we have found though is that actually even though you might do these things or some of these things that doesn't necessarily take care of the actual problem problem mm. right <coughs> would, would you guys agree that yeah. sometimes we might use x cream whatever the cream is for that x but it's still there mm. or we try and change our diet but it's still there or we try and you know exercise more and yet we're still putting on the weight we might also try and ignore these and know that that doesn't help. <laughs> and so what we found is that actually doing that kind of stuff is, is not really solving the problem, it's just solving a symptom, or actually not even solving a symptom, it's just managing, yeah. managing a symptom, temporarily, actually. So we usually end up in these circumstances or get these physical symptoms even because of stuff that we keep doing. So let's call them stuff we keep doing, disempowering behaviours. Right. Stuff we keep doing keeps getting us in those same results. What would be the thing that I keep doing to get myself in a situation of confrontation? Here's a tricky one. Keep engaging in it. <laughs> keep engaging in it. Yeah. Or sometimes it's not it's um what we're doing, but sometimes also what are we not doing that we know is tricky doing. Both kind of angles to it. What else do you think would be? Yeah, we keep engaging it or we keep um, whatever it is, maybe we're in that mode there. What about for um, well, work? You're in a, a circumstance at work that you don't want to be in, but we stay there. Family, work relationships. What's the disempowering behaviours usually with relationships? We keep saying. Yes, when we actually want to say no. Mm. We keep saying no when we mean yes. We don't actually enforce our boundaries. We don't let people know when they've crossed the line of boundaries. 
we don't actually express what we really feel in some of these situations. Um, and so these are some of the things that we keep doing, even though we know they're not good for us. Or these are some of the things that we'll keep doing, even though we know it's not good for us. So why do, and this is something here, old habits, we get stuck in these old patterns or behaviours that keep getting us in these same results. But what's, what's going on is lots of times we become unaware of these. They're actually, we're doing them at an unconscious or a subconscious level. We're not actually aware sometimes that we're doing these things because they've become so much a part of who we are that someone external to us would see what's going on, but us and what we're doing can't see that it's what's going on. <clears throat> so that's usually the link here. We end up in these circumstances because there's stuff that we keep on doing or not doing that ends us up in these circumstances or getting these same physical symptoms. Does that make sense? Does that link there? Mm -hmm. So then if this was the problem, now we've gone down this, to this one level here, if this was the problem, well, we could just say, let's change your behavior. Let's focus on changing your behavior in some way. For some people that means this, well, let's change your diet, change your exercise, change your, right, let's change all the kind of food that you eat, you know, so that you don't get those symptoms anymore. Let's try and do something about it. Um, and that might work for some people, and it does, in some respects. But for some reason, it doesn't become sustainable. And that's usually because there's something else going on underneath where we are stuck in these patterns because of our limiting beliefs or patterns of thought, um, programs that have been kind of set in place over years. So we have these kinds of things going on here, again, subconscious, that keep us stuck in these behaviours that we get you know, stuck in doing, we actually don't realise we're doing them, <coughs> and they keep giving us the same results. Right? Whether they be circumstances we're in or physical symptoms we keep getting. What do you think some of these might be? So for example, um, my behaviour is that I know I should be doing some exercise or eating that food, but I don't. <coughs> right? I don't do it. What's the belief if I if I'm not doing it? Right? I know I should be doing exercise, but I'm not. I'm not doing it. What do you think the belief might be behind that? The limiting belief. Tried it before and it doesn't work. Exactly. I've tried that before and it didn't work. Right? So probability again. What about a behaviour like? I keep saying yes when I actually want to say no. What is the belief behind that? I want people to like me. I want people to like me. If I said no and I actually meant no, they might not like me. Right. Or they might get offended. Or they might cause some confrontation. Mm -hmm. Or they might be disappointed. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to dis disappoint anyone. I want everyone to be happy. Right? I want to please everyone. We might be the kind of obliger kind of one where we try to avoid everything for everyone else. What other beliefs do you think, or patterns of thought, do you think we get stuck in? They say that we have between 12,000 and 60,000 thoughts a day, and 80% of them are negative, which is quite a lot, and 95% of them are the same ones that we've had yesterday. They are recurrent. Right, recurring. So that's that's pretty crazy when you think about it. That 95% of the things that we think and the different thoughts that we have each day are recurring. Right? 80% of them are negative. So that's a lot of recurring negative thought going on. And when you think about that get, getting locked into a pattern or a, a way of thinking, well, we're going to continue to act or not act right, in disempowering ways and end up getting in the situations we don't want to be in. Has anyone tried to note down 
in the, the kind of language that they use or talk to themselves. Not necessarily write it down, but very much aware of it. Yeah, so you become aware of what are you actually saying to yourself about yourself? Yeah, I've always said that um, you couldn't growl me more than what I could growl myself. <laughs> yeah, you and wouldn't that's... talk to somebody else the way that you talk to yourself. No. You know, like exactly. if you saw a friend of yours eating something that they shouldn't be eating, if you're doing it, you're going, oh God, I can't believe you're doing that again, you know, you're bloody, you know, yeah. da da da. Whereas you'd never say that to a friend of yours, but yet we'd give ourselves a whole lot of grief. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And so we're doing that all the time to ourselves. Saying all of the stuff to ourselves in our minds, and that's what's being absorbed and taken in. But you would you're right, you'd never say that out loud. You wouldn't even say that out loud to yourself, let alone to anyone else. But we are thinking it. Right? And so why lots are of, we wired like that? Why are we wired like this? That's a good question. We are, your brain is wired not to for you to be happy, but it's wired for you to survive. So we are only, your brain is only worried about you surviving. It doesn't care how happy you are about it. It's just survival. And so it wants it's <coughs> quite alert, you could say, for any potential threats and dangers. Right? And so anything that's potentially a threat or a threatening situation or a danger, it will highlight, it will record in four different ways, and it will basically alert you if anything similar comes up again in the future. And so we're always on kind of alert looking for what is the potential danger or threat because your brain's wired for survival, not, not to make you happy. So it's like fight or flight. Yeah, so that's the difference between that fight or flight side of the you know, autonomic nervous system where you get stuck in that pattern of thinking. So, um, what was I going to say about that? We're not being chased by dinosaurs anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that puts us in that stress state. Yeah. That fight or flight. That's the cortisol hormone. That's the hormone that I was talking to a group today, actually, just before. Is that you're not going to be uh, releasing weight if you're in a stressful situation, ever, because they're opposing systems. Right. Cortisol. When stress is high, cortisol is high, and cortisol says to keep, right, store fat, it's not to let it go. It's, it's good, it thinks we're in a starvation situation because the stress is so high, right, and so it says store fat, store fat, store fat for the future, right, for the safe. So people that are trying to uh, release weight but are in stressful situations will always be fighting against themselves. So then we could say, well, we'll come to this a bit later on, but a lot of it is depending on what is our perception of the situation. And do we perceive it as stressful or not? So I'll give you an example. When we, <coughs> okay, so back in Chased by a Dinosaur Day, or Chased by a Tiger, or a Lion, whatever, cortisol will go up really high and enable you to get out of the situation quickly. Right? Cortisol, cortisol grows up. Your blood glucose goes up because it needs to mobilize the, the energy throughout your body so you can get your muscles active and get out of there. Right? But then once you're out of the situation, cortisol drops and everything goes back to you know, balance again. The problem today is that our cortisol goes up when we wake up, right? Part of waking up. And then at work, we stay there. And then we keep, when we come back from work, we go and start reading some stuff and the light, even from our devices and stuff, keeps our cortisol up and we don't really get a dip until we're actually asleep. If we you know, you know, get in a decent sleep. Whereas before it was go up, that situation is gone, go back down. Right? Carry on. Another stressful situation, up, down. These days we're up and it's what they call the the chronic stress, and when cortisol is always up like that, we're stuck in this state of chronic stress. Now, what else do you think we would be getting stressed about these days? We're not getting stressed about being chased by lions and tigers, but what, what do we get stressed about today? Money. Money. Yeah. Kids. Being late. Yeah, being late. Just life in general, isn't it? Work. Relationships, mm. work, too much work. Mm. Yeah. So you can see how 
we're basically living on cortisol. We are stressed, and when we're in this kind of range here, um, all of these different triggers are happening around us. Uh, and so it becomes harder for us to change some of these things when we're in maximum stress all the time. So let's link this back up now. This thing here, those limiting beliefs and patterns that we get stuck in, right? the way that we keep on thinking about ourselves, keeps us stuck in patterns of behavior, right? that's not really good, great for us, and end us up in the results or the circumstances, again, the symptoms that we don't want. If this was the problem, we'd say, well, let's change your belief system, right? We just need to do some positive psychology or get you to do some affirmations or whatever it might be. And if you've tried those before, you'll know that sometimes when you're saying the affirmations in the back of your mind, you're also saying that's not true. Right? Lots of people have tried doing affirmations before, and while they might be speaking the affirmation, in the back of their mind they're saying, yeah, whatever. Right. That's because there's that underlying, underpinning stuff going on in our minds. So that tells us that this isn't really at the root cause of what's going on. There's something else that keeps us stuck in this kind of negative, recurring, limiting beliefs. And it's usually these kind of unresolved, so unresolved stuff that we haven't addressed or resolved yet unresolved negative emotions right, that keep us stuck in those patterns of belief, getting those and those as a result. And the more of these we get, the more we feel <coughs> like that. The ones I'm talking about here, as far as emotions go, things like, and fear is the biggest one. Right? But these ones are all really prevalent today. Anger, hurt, guilt, shame, grief. Right, these are some of the mo some of the bigger ones, but there are plenty of other ones. And it's the underlying fears that we have that keep us stuck here. So if I go back to the example way back over here, I keep saying yes when I really want to say no. Why? Because I believe, my belief is that if I said no when I wanted to say no, that person won't like me, or they might be disappointed, or whatever. And the underlying emotion is my fear of rejection, or my fear of not being accepted, or my fear of disappointing someone else, or whatever it might be. Okay. There's tons of other disempowering behaviors that we do. I keep on eating foods that I know are not good for me. Why? What is the belief behind it? It's not going to make a difference. It's not going to make any difference. What's the underlying emotion? Maybe guilt as well. Yep. Could be to do with guilt. It could be about helping ourselves feel better. Because we don't want to, generally, we don't want to feel this stuff. Because this stuff puts us in that fear kind of, or... Um, protection mode or um, survival mode. We don't really want to keep feeling all of this stuff. So what do we normally do when we start feeling some of these? What are our coping mechanisms? What things do we do when we feel like we might be put in a situation that's going to make us feel like this? Or what do we do at the end of the day when we feel stressed and nothing's going right for us? What do we usually try and do? How do we make ourselves feel better? Oh, that goes back up. We've got some yeah. different wine. That's it. We eat the foods that we like, and usually the ones that we like that give us the immediate feeling better are foods that are not great for us. Because they taste great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they take that pain away. Right? Or it could be alcohol, or it could be what else? Any of the any drugs, any any kind of addiction, basically you could say. Right. It's gonna we'll use those or even, and sometimes it's not even about taking some crystal, sometimes it's about uh, controlling other people. Right? 
Because when we control other people, I don't feel uncertain anymore. And sometimes uncertainty is one of these things underneath here. Right? Or a feeling of things are out of control. So what do I do when things are out of control? Control something. Right? Whether that be people or situations or stuff on the desk or whatever. Right? Because it gives us back a sense of certainty. So we'll find that we get stuck doing these things to avoid feeling these things. Right? And they usually also link to this. It's usually something to do with that as well. So this is basically the stress cycle. Because the more that we leave these, the more they compound and get to the point where your physical body has to do something about it. Right? And your physical body deals with this. And we, can, we can think about emotions as energy that's in motion. But here, a lot of times it gets blocked. Okay? Energy is blocked. And we just keep compounding it, we keep pushing it down. We, <coughs> we avoid it by doing all these things, but that doesn't go away. Right? The grief, the anger is still there, the fears are still there, but we're just pushing it down further and further. And forcing our physical body to deal with that. And it does that by giving you physical symptoms to highlight to you that something needs to change. So now, when I think about these, or even these circumstances, they're more like messages or messengers to tell us that something is needs changing. Something needs changing. We need to do something different. Right, so this is our stress cycle. Any any questions about this to this point so far? Can you see how that links together? Yeah. Does it make sense? Because <laughs> 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 this is really like the old treadmill thing. Yeah. yeah. What gets stuck on the treadmill? Mm. Yeah. And we should think we should run faster. Because that'll help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> faster and faster. No, you need to keep going faster. Yeah. And in fact, that's some, some of, sometimes that's that coping thing as well. Be busy. Mm -hmm. The busier you, you are, the less you need to think about this. Mm, there's like no other time to it. No time to it, yeah. Mm. If I can fill my day being as busy as I can, I can avoid feeling any of that stuff. And usually that helps us feel good if we're ticking some stuff off. You know, we get that little dopamine hit to tell us that actually <coughs> you've achieved something today, feel good. Right, and that's what all of, that's all of these things do is they help us feel good fast, right? And that's that's because of this joke here. It's not a joke, but it's a thing in your brain, dopamine. Right, it makes you feel better quickly. But the more that we use the same thing, the more tolerant we become to it, and so the more of it we need to feel better. So we could be initially just do a little bit, be a little bit busier. But over time, your body becomes used to that and you've got to be busier and busier and busier to get the same effect. Does that make sense? Mm. Same way a drug works and that initially you can get the hype on that straight away, but after recurrent use of it, you need more and more and more of the same drug to get the same effect. So what this all is trying to show us is that there are these things going on that usually we don't address, that we don't want to talk about, that we kind of leave, um, and that ends up keeping us stuck in this pattern here. Whereas once we start looking at these, and we start to address them, at least identify and acknowledge them, we can begin to dissolve these links here, right? And then we can create new beliefs and patterns new behaviours and get a new result. Which sounds easy. <laughs> <laughs> sounds pretty straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> Until you start doing it. And that's usually where people get overwhelmed with, you know, there's so many things that, you know, I'm supposed to be doing. And that's where we get into the next thing around growth cycles or um, 
and starting with the small things and being consistent with them over time. But for now, does this all make sense? And is, uh, do you have any situations that you want me to go specific to that relate to this or that you don't see how it fits in? Is there any situations that you can think of that, that don't fit in with this particular cycle? <coughs> Or maybe you've got something in mind that you're in your own experience and you're saying, oh, does it really fit in there? Or you want to know what the actual behaviours are, or maybe even you want to know what's the belief, or what are the underlying emotions for different situations. Because each symptom, physical symptom, has a <coughs> correlating underlying <coughs> emotion attached to it. And the different circumstances that we find ourselves in, depending on what our perception of that situation is, helps us understand what is like, the root cause of it. Because um, I could see a situation differently to you, and it might be different to you and different to each of us. <coughs> Yet it's the same situation. So why would some situation stress me out, but not stress you out? Personality, yeah, so it could be around personalities. What else could it be to do? Yeah, just your perception. Yeah, what things, yeah, what things are worrying you. Like yeah. you might be more sensitive to something because of something that's happened. Right. So there might be something that's happened before <coughs> that is similar to this. And, and it didn't end well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that previous thing stressed me out. This one looks really similar to that. Mm -hmm. So this looks stressful to me. But for you, it might not be. And so the reason why that is, is because we <coughs> we create four memories when we have any kind of stressful or traumatic event. Every event, every negative, stressful, traumatic event, there are four memories. The first one is an intellectual. <coughs> That's your normal kind of, I remember when, blah, blah, blah. Right? This changes over time. Have you noticed that? <coughs> your memory of something that happened before is fluid. <coughs> yeah. So if you... Today you remember some event in a certain way, in another 10 years you may remember it differently. In fact, in even a week you may remember it differently. It's even quite soon, like if you go and look at an open home, and then you go, oh, I really like that, and then you, uh, by a week later, if you've been thinking about it, and you go back to it, it's completely different to what I think, you know, over the week, Mm. It can visualise like that. I just yeah. remember doing that when we were looking to buy a home years ago, and you yeah. just go, "Oh my goodness, that one is not like I remembered it at all." Yeah, yeah. But over the week, I've tried to tried to glorify it the way that I wanted it to be, and then yeah. I think you do that with people as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. especially if you're drinking, man, he was amazing. <laughs> have a look at the way the next day. <laughs> <laughs> So these are fluid memories, right? They change over time. That's the thing to remember. It's this intellectual memory. There are three other ones that are not so flexible or fluid, but they are all stored in your in your body. So here's the first one. It's a visual memory, right? So every stressful negative event, you would take a picture, right? a visual memory of it, a visual imprint. Uh, then you also have a chemical memory of it. And the chemical memory is what happens in your physical body, is in what different um, neurotransmitters or hormones are firing at the time. So, for example, um, you would have you would have experienced a chemical memory when you smelled something that reminded you of a memory from a long time ago. You smelled that perfume, and then, oh, that reminded me of that, mm -hmm. right? What do you so that's a, that's an example of a chemical memory. So we have a visual memory, a chemical memory, another one is a cellular memory. And the cellular memory is about 
what you actually felt in that moment. Right, so if it was fear or anger or hurt or guilt or shame or whatever, that's been installed as a cellular memory. Right, and there's, there's a really good book called Molecules of Emotion uh, by Candice Pert, and she talks about that exactly. She's a um, scientist, cell biologist, and so she was showing that these molecules <coughs> are actually what underpin these emotions that we have. And so they're stored as a cellular memory, and these three hang out together, but they're quite tightly bound together. This one's kind of out by itself kind of thing, and it's quite fluid. These ones get locked in. That's why even though you might try and talk your <coughs> way uh, through counselling sessions to resolve past situations, if it's not addressing these other three memories of the circumstance or the situation, it won't actually have the impact that you're looking for. Because we're not resolving these things at that level. So we've still got the memories there. These are all subconscious. Now, the reason why we do that is because, again, your brain is wired for survival. And so any time any of these things come up that look like that other stressful event, that you know smell like that other event, that feel like that other event, that will trigger a stress response. Right, and the stress response is to help you get out of the situation. Does that kind of make sense? What happens though if it has a good connotation? You know, like, you know, you might smell Indeed, some good. food, yeah, and then you're like, oh, yeah, that's food that reminds me of when I was a kid or something. Yeah. That's not going to give you a negative thing, though, is no, it? No, no, no. Yeah. no those are associated mm. with positive mm. situations. Mm. But your brain is, has you remembered and locked in place all of these negative situations that are stressful because it wants to protect you from those in the future. Special stress. Yeah. So that's how it, how it does it. So it's got these four memories going on. Basically it's trying to protect you when you see this, or when you feel this, or when you, you know, have these kind of sensations come back again, that means get out of there. Okay. Um, and so that's, I guess, just another thing to think about when we talk about the kind of underlying emotions that are going on. This is where they're kept. levels here, visual, chemical and cellular memory. And so in order to resolve some of those <coughs> fears, anger, hurt, guilt, shame, stuff like that, we, we want to acknowledge them, but also we need to resolve the situation or event that brought them up, and we've got to resolve that by looking at all of these, not just one of them. And too often, um, they only look at the one. You want to pop in a couple of ones? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying, I keep using my note paper, so I'm just writing notes on my phone, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> no. So we need to Any Any questions about the memory stuff or any of that? Can we see why that's important? Or not? Well, you know, you know, you know I, I know that too, because you know, particularly if it's a personal smell, mm. and sometimes that can be. Um, just a, a, a touch sometimes, you know, mm. or a moment where someone is telling you something or doing something like that, that their tone or something like that yeah, yeah. is there, and you have to realise that the content of what they're saying is not the issue. Mm -hmm. The issue is the way they're saying it. Yeah, <laughs> you right. can simply say that to my brother. It's not their content. It's yeah, yeah. it's your um, mm. yeah. Well, it's your delivery. It's, it's your delivery. the tone. It's your delivery is not feeling. Good. Yeah. The feeling you're getting that's been triggered within you is to deal with the tone or the way it's being delivered because that's reminding us of previous experiences where that wasn't great. Yeah, well, it does become self-aware, I suppose. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 So that's, I guess that's, the link between that is just, you know, where we're storing these emotions is here right, at these levels. And when I say cellular, I mean like an empty cell. 
And the first one is actually that and that your muscles have a memory. Yeah. Yeah, so that you do something so that may definitely remember. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's what happens when, you know, learning an instrument or learning a piano for example. If you know They have a memory. Yeah, you can yeah. just remember it. Right, it's just the memory behind it. So that's cool. So let's get on to now we know that these are all linked. Well, how do we resolve some of those underlying emotions? Right, how do we actually address them? Well, the first thing is to be able to identify them. And acknowledge them. So that's about understanding what it is, that, what is it that you keep saying to yourself, right? Understanding what it is that you keep saying, that's important, but also then to identify what about the situation or what does the situation make me feel? So it would be acknowledging that I feel whatever or using something like it feels like whatever. Because right. when we put it into this context, actually it doesn't matter about the situation per se, the scenario actually it doesn't matter. What really matters is how you feel about the situation. And then I said our it's about our perception of the situation. And I'll see it differently than you. So for you, it's important to identify, for you, that situation makes you feel da da da, or makes you feel like da da da. What is it that identify, let? Acknowledge. Acknowledge, sorry. Acknowledge. Sorry, so it's supposed to be like a, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I do find it acknowledging what it is we feel about the situation. It's usually the first step. How about if you don't actually know how you feel? Because <laughs> that's, that's, that's a big one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do I actually feel angry, annoyed, or pissed off? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, or is it just that I'm just in, this, <coughs> in, a, in, a, in a thing of flux? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, so you identify, and that's the whole thing about this, is go be <coughs> your own words. <coughs> right, so don't go someone else telling you how you feel about a situation. You've actually got to find within you what, what words you would use to describe it. Because actually within the description usually will hold some of the the um, the keys to unlocking what's going on. So if you describe a situation in a certain way, the same way that you use to describe it would be relevant probably in some other situations. So it's important that, you know, I don't put words in your mouth kind of thing because it's for you to go within and find out what does it actually mean for you? What does it feel like for you? If you had to put it in a sentence, I feel da da da, what would you put there? And I feel angry or hurt or annoyed or frustrated or whatever. The, the key to this is that you're actually saying now out loud instead of just thinking, you're actually